True Spies is sponsored by BetterHelp. I'm Justin Trefcon, and I'm a producer for True Spies. Have you ever felt like you were driving with the brakes on? To anyone on the outside, you were ticking all the boxes of a successful life. But inside, something was wrong. Well, that was me before I reached out for help. Therapy was a way of spending time with myself, starting to figure out these feelings. It opened up a path for me to a happier, more authentic way of being. At first, I was totally against the idea of therapy. I didn't think it was for me. But then I took the plunge and signed up. Having someone to talk to, who was only there for me, changed my life. I had to trust in the process, which meant I had to trust myself. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. So if you're thinking of starting some therapy, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and completely works with your schedule. So just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash spyscape to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash spyscape. This podcast is a dramatization based on a true story and real events. It was created after research from various sources, including E. Howard Hunt's own writings. For dramatic purposes, the podcast contains fictionalized scenes, including imagined dialogue. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are those of the characters only and do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions held by individuals on which those characters are based. This story also contains strong language throughout. Incoming transmission. Welcome. 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 This is True Spies. Listo. The podcast that takes you deep inside the greatest secret missions of all time. Week by week, you'll hear the true stories behind the operations that have shaped the world we live in. True Spies. You'll meet the people who live life undercover. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. We needed to prove to the higher-ups that our work was essential in the war against the Soviets. Not just necessary, essential. Yeah, it was time to start making movies. If Disney could do it, why not the CIA? I'm Daisy Ridley. Welcome to the True Spies JFK season from Spyscape Studios. In the early 1950s, American spycraft was undergoing a radical transformation. While the country's European allies and enemies had for decades deployed experienced spooks on the ground, the US lagged far behind in the intelligence stakes. That all changed in 1947 when the OSS became the Central Intelligence Agency. A world-class intelligence gathering capability was essential if the United States was to stay ahead of its enemies. But while orthodox intelligence gathering was ramped up, a more sinister, shadowy organization within the CIA was also forming. This was the part of the CIA concerned with not just informing the military and political establishment, but influencing their decisions and shaping their policies. And one of the most controversial tactics the agency pioneered was a new form of warfare called PSYOPs. Psychological Operations. This was a unit within the CIA dedicated to changing hearts and minds through the strategic use of propaganda. That's when the notion came up to take a respected work of literature and turn it into a movie for the masses. The respected work in question was Animal Farm by the celebrated British author George Orwell. In this episode, the first of a three-part series, We'll tell the story of how the CIA PSYOPs unit turned a much admired work of popular fiction, written by a champion of the left, into a work of anti-Soviet propaganda, without anyone noticing. Absolutely no one could know it was the CIA backing the project, not even the people making it. Our guide is one of the most notorious and controversial figures in all of espionage history. Everett Howard Hunt, known as Howard Hunt, or even Howie by his friends, 
was the archetypal cold warrior. For 25 years, Hunt was responsible for running some of the most notorious covert assignments ever mounted by the CIA. Missions that were otherwise known as dirty tricks operations. Inspired by Hunt's surviving writings and historical research, True Spies brings him back to life to tell his definitive and uncensored side of the story. And Hunt was quite the storyteller. Prepare yourself for one of the most outlandish tales in CIA history. Welcome then to Howard Hunt Unleashed, part one, the CIA and Animal Farm. Howard Hunt came from solid middle-class American stock. Having first been recruited into the OSS by its maverick chief, Wild Bill Donovan, Hunt saw action firsthand exposing a double agent in India before running supplies to Chinese forces trying to repel the Japanese. After that, he'd set up the first CIA station in Mexico, where he'd become fluent in Spanish, which would come in handy down the line. He'd also got married in 1949 to Dorothy Wetzel. Dorothy was herself a former CIA employee who'd served in Shanghai and Paris, where she met Hunt. All the while, Hunt had also been nurturing an equally successful career as a novelist, writing popular war and spy novels that had won him a Guggenheim Fellowship. It was a good cover for his agency work, but in reality, it was more than that. I don't think I could have written those books without my agency work, but which did I enjoy the most? There's not much to beat a good day's writing, that I can admit. Howard Hunt had already established himself as one of the CIA's most trusted and effective operatives when, in 1950, the US failed to pick up on North Korea's plans to invade South Korea. The credibility of US intelligence faced a major setback. The nascent CIA was under pressure to justify its existence and, importantly, its budget in the wake of this error. The CIA had been founded for research, analysis and the collection of intelligence, but with the looming threat of communism, exacerbated by the Korean War, some inside the agency believed more extreme methods would be needed to win this ideological battle. Of course, nowhere in the CIA's founding charter did it stipulate its funds were to be used for dirty tricks. But that was exactly what agents like Howard Hunt found themselves drawn to. In that sense, the Marshall Plan was a gift. The Marshall Plan of 1947 was a US-led initiative to provide financial assistance to European nations to help rebuild their depleted economies after the war. The main focus of the funds was rebuilding infrastructure. It was not a CIA propaganda tool. The OPC chief, Frank Wisner, cooked up this idea, Operation Mockingbird, where we'd siphon off official funds for the Allied reconstruction and divert them into PSYOPs. Frank Wisner was the head of the division of the CIA that ran the propaganda and PSYOPs units. Operation Mockingbird was essentially an all-out assault on all media. Radio, movies, the press. To turn the intellectual and ideological tide against communism forever. The Soviets had rejected the Allies' offer to collaborate in reconstruction. We knew that. So we had no choice but to begin the deconstruction of the communist ideology. Don't forget... At the end of the Second World War, the US and the Soviet Union were officially allies. But this was a partnership born of necessity. The defeat of Nazism had been the cause that had brought them together. In reality, the Allies were fearful of the growing influence of communism. I had my first proper encounter with communism after the war in Vienna. It was very clear to me that this was a, a new kind of evil. Their secret police were everywhere. and. They had only one way of dealing with people who they ran up against, if you know what I mean. They executed them in cold blood. Which brings us to George Orwell and Animal Farm. We knew this guy, Orwell, was a leftist. He'd fought in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the socialists. In normal circumstances, he's the last guy whose words we'd want to turn into a movie. But, uh, you know, being a writer myself, I figured... There was a way of telling this story about a bunch of animals taking over a farm and the horrific consequences of this uh, collective action. 
that would lend itself seamlessly to our ideas about how the world should and should not be run. The Spanish Civil War had also revealed the lengths Stalin would go to to spread orthodox communist ideology. George Orwell had witnessed this brutality firsthand. In 1936, Orwell volunteered for the leftist forces in Spain to repel the fascist military takeover led by General Franco. It was, you could say, fashionable to do so amongst some of the high-minded literary set. Uh, Hemingway went out there too. The Spanish Republican government had appealed to the international community for military support, but uh, no one was keen to get involved. Enter Joseph Stalin. The Soviet leader saw a chance to bolster the Soviet cause in supporting the leftist forces against Franco. He sent agents and munitions to Spain to fight alongside the democratically elected Spanish Republicans. Stalin knew that a socialist victory in Spain would be good propaganda for international communism. But Stalin's support for the Spanish left came at a heavy, even fatal, price. Stalin exported more than just arms. The NKVD, Stalin's secret police, began hunting down and brutally executing the Spanish Republicans, who were opposed to communism. The Spanish communists took over the fight against the fascists, but this infighting ultimately weakened the opposition to Franco's better trained and more effective army. The resistance fell, and Spain became a fascist dictatorship. Orwell was horrified at what he experienced in Spain. He was outspoken in his criticism of the Soviets. Rumors circulated that his life was in danger, and he was forced to avoid places where Stalinists were known to hang out. Even some of his local pubs in London became no-go areas. Despite being born into privilege, Orwell established himself as a powerful left-wing commentator. Through books like The Road to Wigan Pier, and down and out in Paris and London, he became a fierce advocate for the poor and a harsh critic of the greedy industrialist class that exploited and oppressed them. The true horrors of Soviet Russia were yet to be fully revealed to the world, but the warning signs were clear. Now that Hitler had been defeated, a new and terrifying threat was emerging from the East, and the threat of Stalinist violence followed Orwell everywhere he went. I heard he ran into Hemingway in Paris in 45. Apparently, he was so afraid of being neutralized by the Soviet agents that were running around the place, he asked Hemingway for a gun. Orwell's literary response to the deadly threat posed by totalitarianism was the instant classic Animal Farm. The book is a brilliant political allegory in which a bunch of farmyard animals overthrow a corrupt, exploitative farmer and take over the farm. Orwell made a direct comparison between the way humans exploit animals and the way the rich exploit workers. But mirroring what had happened in Soviet Russia, the animal revolutionaries are themselves corrupted by power. Their methods end up being even more repressive than the farmers. It didn't take much wit to see how clearly Orwell was pointing the finger at Stalin and his distorted, dystopian form of communism. That's why the book appealed to us. We knew it was a powerful message, and it would be clear to everyone. Unlike Hunt's pulpy novels, Animal Farm had originally struggled to find a publisher. Its criticisms of Stalinism were considered harmful to the overall cause of international socialism by a host of left-leaning publishers on both sides of the Atlantic. However, by the time it was finally released in the US in 1946, the book had already started to capture the popular imagination which was when Hunt's plan hit its first obstacle. MI6 had already put in an offer to the publisher for the adaptation rights. The race was on to turn Orwell's bestseller into a blockbuster hit, which is when Hunt's plan hit its next hurdle. Orwell had died. Turns out Orwell had contracted TB around the publication of Animal Farm. It was a pretty lousy way to go, you know? The dying Orwell had remarried in his final months, and his widow, Sonia, now had full control of the estate. Recently, she has regained some respect amongst historians, but back then, Sonia Orwell was perceived as a money-grabbing opportunist. When I first read the book, uh, Orwell was sick and lonely. We should have put our offer in then. Of all the challenges I envisaged, I hadn't factored in that there'd be a new wife standing between us and our movie. 
But Sonia Orwell's ultimate price for handing over the film rights was not money, although she wanted that too. It was something far harder to obtain. She wanted to meet the king. The king was not some European royalty. No, Sonia Orwell wanted to be introduced to her hero, the King of Hollywood, which, to anyone alive at the time, meant she wanted to meet Clark Gable. Lights, camera, action. Operation Mockingbird's biggest challenge so far. <laughs> A date with Rhett Butler himself. <laughs> Easy, right? To our younger listeners, Clark Gable may not be the most familiar of names, but by the late 1940s, the handsome actor was well established as the world's most sought after and bankable film star. Of the many memorable roles he'd performed, none was more successful or career defining than Rhett Butler, the swashbuckling hero of Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind remains in the top five highest grossing films of all time to this day. Well, luckily, uh... I had two advantages over our friends at MI6. Uh, one, I had done a stint in Hollywood myself. Which is true. After his third book, Stranger in Town, was published, Hunt was lured to Los Angeles to try his luck as a scriptwriter. I was wined and dined in the traditional style for a few weeks. <laughs> you know, pretty girls, champagne, all of it. I learned mighty fast that you're never as appealing as when you're all promised when it's all ahead of you. Once I started writing actual scripts, the whining and dining slowed down and the girls got less pretty till it stopped altogether. That, then, was my big, fat Hollywood career. Hunt also maintained, though it's hard to prove, that his Hollywood prospects were limited by his political leanings. Oh, everyone knows Hollywood's a liberal town. Woe betide a conservative who tries to break into that cozy little club. On the other hand, by his own admission... Hunt's scripts weren't very good. Maybe that had a hand in curtailing his dreams. It was also the beginning of the Red Scare, and Hollywood's elite leftist circles were closing their ranks to avoid infiltration and blacklisting. Which turned out to be advantageous when it came to recruiting the services of Mr. Gable. The king was that rare thing in Tinseltown, a Republican. He was on our side. Gable was also a war hero, he had been married to actress Carol Lombard. They were the Burton and Taylor of their day, the most celebrated couple in the movies. But when Lombard was killed in a plane crash, Gable's mental health spiraled. Fueled by depression, he enlisted in the army and flew combat missions in Europe. After returning to the States a decorated war hero, Gable remarried, but the relationship soon floundered. It's clear he never really got over Lombard. So we had to lure this depressed, introverted, heartbroken heartthrob on a date with a notorious, status-seeking gold digger. What could go wrong? Orwell's biographers are divided on what happened when Sonia Orwell met Clark Gable, or indeed whether that assignation ever took place. Trust me, it happened. I made it happen. Either way, after back and forth with Sonia and Orwell's agents, the rights deal was agreed. Not that Sonia Orwell thought, for a second, she was optioning her beloved husband's masterpiece to the Central Intelligence Agency. But Hunt's travails had only just begun. With the film rights secured, Hunt needed a producer on board to create distance between the CIA and the project. Enter Louis de Rochemont. Louis de Rochemont was one of those aristocratic Americans that I kind of despised, usually. He was descended from Huguenot, so everyone kept telling me. Anyway, turns out de Rochemont was a great film producer and a patriot. Hated commies as much as I did, which made him an easy sell to Wisner. Wisner had become something of a father figure to Howard Hunt, and Hunt was keen to curry favor with his boss. He was a man of action. In a world full of talkers, they tend to stand out. Men of action. These were the kinds of people Hunt gravitated towards, and he undoubtedly saw himself as one. And it's worth considering why, as it can tell us a lot about the trajectory of his career. Hunt always felt an insecurity about his place in society, 
that dogged him till his dying day. And like another of his heroes, Richard Nixon, Hunt developed a chip on his shoulder. Hunt was posh by American standards, just not posh enough. He was acutely aware there was an elite layer of society to which he did not have access, just out of reach. Which in turn led him to fall for these men of action, like Wild Bill Donovan, the maverick head of the OSS, and now Wisner, and eventually perhaps his greatest hero of all, the Machiavellian CIA chief, Alan Dulles. All of them, it could be argued, were projections of Hunt's own father. Dad was a lawyer by trade, but he wasn't one of those uh, greasy Ivy League types. He worked for a living. And when necessary, he took the law into his own hands. When uh, one of his business partners absconded with Dad's money, he got on the first plane to Havana and brought this guy back single-handed. <laughs> I guess that taught me a lesson about life. If you want to get something done, you're going to see the best result if you do the job yourself. Which leads us back to Animal Farm. With de Rochemont approved as the film's official producer and the CIA funds secured, it should have been plain sailing. Well, it's been exaggerated for a fact, but uh, yes, we had somewhat underestimated the time and actual cost, uh, not to mention all the rest that goes into making one of these things. On de Rochemont's recommendation, and to avoid anyone getting suspicious of who the film's real backers were, de Rochemont convinced Hunt and the CIA that the best place to make the film was England. The only problem, there weren't any animation studios in the UK big enough to make a feature-length film of this kind. Back then, animated films were made in the most labor-intensive way possible. Every single frame of a cartoon had to be hand-drawn, and the illusion of movement was created painstakingly by making minute adjustments to each drawing which made the UK essential as a production base for another reason. Thanks to the success of Walt Disney, animation in America had skyrocketed in popularity. But in the UK, where there was less of a precedent, there were no animation guilds or unions to protect laborers. De Rochemont estimated we could make this thing for 50% of what it would cost stateside. De Rochemont's choice of filmmakers were acclaimed animation partners, Joy Batchelor and John Hallas. With established careers in making cartoon shorts, the duo were ideal candidates for the ambitious animal farm. Between them, they had the style, taste, and expertise to pull off the best possible version of the film. And they both respected Orwell's writing. So much so that when the film deal was signed and news of it reached the press, Halas loudly stated to journalists, the film would deviate as little as possible from Orwell's original story. But in truth, the film's CIA backers had no intention of sticking with Orwell's version. Well, it's an old trick, right? It's important to build trust and confidence, and we didn't want to rock the boat, so to speak. The Brits get very protective of their writers. Think of all the fuss they made when someone, uh, oh, I can't remember who, added a few words to Shakespeare when they made a movie of one of his plays. We had to tread carefully, but right from the start, we knew stuff had to change. What is clear from first-hand accounts is that throughout the process, Bachelor and Hallas believed that they were making a conventional film with conventional backing. Even with that backing coming from an unnamed distributor in the US, the filmmakers diligently engaged with the notes they received and, apparently, never once questioned the source of the feedback or the money even when the feedback started to look a lot like it was pushing the film towards anti-communist propaganda. The thing is, and everyone agreed with me on this point, Orwell's book ended in a very depressing way. It was a real downer, as they say in Hollywood. And you don't have to be Einstein to work out that uh, audiences get turned off by downbeat endings. They want to leave the theater elated. I detected some snobbery from the Brits, that it was crass Americans wanting to cheapen their sacred texts. But, you know, I always felt we were looking for the necessary changes to make sure that people would want to come and see the damn thing. In reality, nine versions of the script were produced before the backers, aka the CIA, would sign off on the story. With each new revision, Bachelor and Halas did their best to accommodate the changes. But ultimately, 
all those changes brought about production delays, which came at a significant financial cost. With my experience in writing novels, uh, successful novels, I might add, you know, I felt I knew a thing or two about stories. If you want my honest opinion, I reckon I could have fixed the script myself, but de Rochemont brought in this hack called Martin. John Stuart Martin was a renowned writer of propaganda films. He was hired to come on board Animal Farm to help make it more commercial. Even though Hunt, the CIA, and de Rochemont had explicitly agreed to avoid the Disneyfication of the story, Martin started to suggest changes that were aimed at making the film more palatable for younger audiences. What suddenly became clear to the filmmakers was that the so-called backers now wanted full editorial control, something that had never been agreed. Well, there were these three areas of disagreement we were stuck on. The main characters, the animals standing in for Stalin and Trotsky, were too sympathetic. Then there was the fact that the novel seemed to be saying that all farmers were bad, which was wrong and a lie. And uh, then there was the ending, which from my side looked like an endorsement of anarchism. I mean, none of which was in line with the message we were trying to get across. In fact, the filmmakers were being asked to endorse the ideological and political agenda of the now transforming CIA. An organization that had gone from working to contain the spread of communism to now rolling back the spread of communism. In other words, the CIA was now without anyone knowing, pursuing regime changes around the world. By the time Animal Farm was in its second year of production, the Dulles brothers, the architects of this new form of covert US foreign policy, had taken over US intelligence. They were now actively pursuing an imperialist agenda aimed at protecting US business and political interests, whatever the consequences. So, a propaganda film that explicitly showed capitalism in a negative light, intentionally or not, was unacceptable. And Hunt, more than anyone, sought favor with the Dulles brothers, especially the new CIA chief, Allen. So something had to give. But the filmmakers weren't going to cave in without a fight. Hallis played that old trick to try and get us to back down. You know, the one where they said, they want to do what we want, but, you know, it would drive up the budget, and, well, nobody wants that, right? But that's where we had the upper hand all along. Sure, we needed this thing to get finished, and finished soon, but we wanted it right, and we were prepared for the long haul. Again, Hunt is being a little disingenuous. The CIA's diverted Marshall Plan funds were certainly not unlimited, and the longer the project took to make, the more their spending would be scrutinized. And Operation Mockingbird needed to be a success to ensure the ongoing viability of the PSYOPs unit in the CIA and bolster the agency's credibility. Spending large sums of money on a project that was overrunning by a year or more would seriously undermine the objective. But after a script summit was called in New York, de Rochemont was still unable to convince the filmmakers to adopt all of the CIA's changes. We'd been playing it all wrong. These liberal types, there's nothing they fear more than obscurity. Not getting their film finished was a lot worse than what we were proposing editorially. So the CIA played their trump card and threatened to pull the plug on additional funding. Either de Rochemont would have to find alternative financing or he and the filmmakers would have to accept the changes to the story. You can see where this is going. In a last ditch attempt to save the integrity of the project, Halas suggested reverting to the original, more ambiguous ending that rejected all forms of totalitarian rule, not just communism, but to no avail. How stupid did he think we were? Production was now stretching into its third year. De Rochemont pushed the filmmakers to their breaking point to hit the CIA-imposed deadline for completion. And that meant accepting the agency's story demands or failing to finish the film on time. By the summer of 1954, animation production was completed on Animal Farm. Bachelor and Hallas were hoping to breathe a sigh of relief. All that was left was the narration. Looking back, I think the voiceover was always going to be how we saved the film. Heck, I purged it of any remaining traces of Orwell's bad ideas. 
To expand the appeal of the film, the filmmakers hired an American actor, Gordon Heath, to voice the narration. But that wasn't enough for the CIA. They wanted control over every word. And in the end, the voiceover narration was rewritten seven times before the CIA would sign it off. It's funny, but uh, when you look at it, I think it would be a fair assessment to say we ended up behaving exactly like a studio would. Seeing it from their angle, I'm not ashamed to say I have a little more sympathy for these media monoliths than I had when I was running around town hawking my scripts. Animal Farm received its world premiere on December 29th, 1954. All the filmmakers attended. The relief that the feature-length cartoon, the first ever to come out of the UK, was finally getting its release, was palpable. It had been no mean feat. It had taken 300,000 man-hours and 250,000 drawings to bring Animal Farm to life. Reviews, however, were mixed. In a warm-up for today's culture wars, many left-leaning critics felt the film was too broad in its condemnation of communism, while the right-wing critics complained that it didn't go far enough. The UK's response, loyal to the homegrown Orwell, was especially hostile to the revised ending. By today's standards, the film was a flop. Nonetheless, I'm proud of what we did with Animal Farm. It may not be gone with the wind, but it stands up, I think. No one's going to say this out loud, but uh, I think it helped the book, too. I heard it was on the curriculum in West Germany when the city was partitioned. Uh, are you telling me all those young people would have come to the book were it not for our film? And the irony that the acclaimed democratic socialist, champion of the oppressed and enemy of totalitarianism, George Orwell, had an adaptation of Animal Farm funded by the CIA is not lost on Hunt. You could argue we had the last laugh, if that's your way of thinking about these things. We did what we intended to do and got what we wanted. How many studio moguls can say that? But that wasn't the end of Operation Mockingbird. The CIA's anti-communist propaganda vehicle was to continue until it was exposed by investigative journalists in the 1970s. These reporters uncovered a vast network of influence that had co-opted writers for Time, Newsweek, CBS, The New York Times, and many, many more to run stories planted and often written by the CIA. As for Howard Hunt, by the time Animal Farm was released, he'd already moved on to other things. The call to action was too strong to ignore. Turns out if you want to fight communism, you have to actually fight it. By 54, when our motion picture was being finished, I was up to my neck in the whole Guatemala thing. And then, just five years later, Fidel Castro showed up, and then everything changed. The threat to our national security was no longer hypothetical. Suddenly, there was a bona fide Soviet puppet state 90 miles from the mainland. Hunt was integral to the ensuing attempt to depose Castro. The ill-fated Bay of Pigs operation was perhaps the most overt American attempt at regime change yet. But it's after the Bay of Pigs fiasco where this story takes us next, to Dallas, Texas, on November 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Join us for part two next week. I'm Daisy Ridley. You can learn more about Orwell's experiences of the Spanish Civil War and the genesis of Animal Farm in a special bonus episode available to subscribers of Spicegate Plus. And the original hand-drawn frames from the Animal Farm film are on view and available to buy at Spicegate. Visit spicegate.com slash animalfarm for details. If you're enjoying this podcast, please click now to give it a five-star rating or leave a review. Ratings and reviews help people discover the podcast and help us bring you more great stories. And if you have some time, why not forward the podcast to a few friends?